Lord Jesus, we just ask that you would be present with us today, that you would give us insight into your word. Lord, this is a complex thing that we're dealing with today, theological deep waters. We want to understand the purposes you had. We know that you love the nation of Israel, and then by extension, all of us, the world, but we know that you came for the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and yet you gave us some of these parables that were incredibly difficult to try and discern. You, you told these parables and you taught these parables because you loved Israel, not because you were in any way anti-Semitic. So Lord, give us the right spirit that we might understand how it was that the chosen people to be a conduit, a light to the nations, could somehow miss you as its long-awaited Messiah. Give us penetrating insight so that we might love you and also not make the same mistake in our culture in the 21st century as followers of yours. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Okay, so the last few weeks we've been looking at this very interesting parable Jesus told. And I'm going to quickly, I won't read the whole thing, but it says uh, in Luke chapter 20, he told this parable, a man planted a vineyard and rented it out to vine growers and went on a journey for a long time. I'm not going to read the whole thing. And then you know what we've been discussing is that he sent some slaves and then they beat him and then they beat him again and then they beat him again. And finally he says, look, I'm going to send my own son and surely they'll respect him. And yet they wanted the inheritance, it says, very simply that so that the inheritance will be ours, let's kill the son. Now, Jesus is telling this preemptively before he was actually going to the cross. Why? Because he was trying to communicate to the Jewish leaders of his day that they were, in fact, going to be guilty. Now, how could he know that? Why was he prophesying? Why was he predicting? Why, why couldn't he have just corrected their understanding? Oh, he'd tried. For three years, he'd made a very diligent effort to go to Jerusalem during the prescribed feast and explain who he was. And obviously, most of the ministry he did was in the northern part of Israel, up near the Sea of Galilee, where he was, well, he got a pretty good reception over the course of the three years that he did ministry. And he was often criticized, harshly criticized, and accused of blasphemy and many other things. And yet, he finally said, it's come down to this. The Father has been sending prophets to you, well, not just now, but for the, for the very course of your, well, all the way back to Father Abraham and then through Moses and the law, and you become this people that come out of slavery, and God continued to have sent you prophets time and time again. We look at Matthew 23, and you rejected those prophets. And now this is the ultimate prophet. I'm the ultimate Deuteronomy 18 prophet, a prophet like Moses, that if you reject this prophet you will be cut off. This goes all the way back to the Torah or the Pentateuch, the first five books attributable to Moses, some twelve to 1,500 years before the time of Jesus. And, and here they were going to be guilty of that, and why? That's the question. Why did they miss Jesus as the Messiah? Last week we looked, and again, this has application to us in the 21st century, so don't just put this off or out of your mind and imagine that somehow this is just a historical review of the nation of Israel. This is applicable to me today. Today, it's to you. We all in some ways want to kill the message of Jesus because it's penetrating. It's not just them way back then. Today, Jesus teaches things, and I'm, you know, I have the privilege of teaching sometimes five, six hours a week in different places, going through the Bible in different contexts, and most of the time, I'm completely feel slain by his word. I read it and I go, Jeff, is this, does this really picture, is this a picture of your life? It's difficult, the teachings of Jesus. But their first miscalculation was that they wanted the inheritance to be theirs. Nothing wrong with that, but in their terms, on their way, not the Father's plan. So that's what we looked at last week, and we began to look at that the inheritance will never come through the law. We look back at Paul's letter to the Galatians. The inheritance does not come through being a good woman or being a good man. It never was meant and intended to do that. The law was given to us for a very specific purpose, and that was to bring our sin, our fallenness, all the way back to Adam, out in the open so that we could see it. it doesn't, it's not for other people to see it so that I can have the proper introspective look into my own heart and recognize I'm the problem in the world. 
I'm the problem. I'm a participant in the problem, and that's why Jesus used the law. I was with a group this last week that we had kind of concluded at one of the clubs, and, and I, I quoted Galatians 2, final verse, and it said, look, if righteousness, if goodness, if, and then by extension, if the inheritance can come through righteousness, then Christ died needlessly. There was no reason for Jesus to come. If we could achieve good status and then by extension, the inheritance would be ours if we could do that on our own. And that was the miscalculation that the religious leaders made. They felt they were God's, well, elite forces in the world, especially the Pharisees. They wanted the inheritance to be theirs, but they thought that they were, well, that they had already achieved it through their own righteousness. And in doing so, they so badly miscalculated that they were actually participants in killing the king of the universe. Imagine. But let's talk a little bit this morning about inheritance. We know what their miscalculation was, but how? what should we know about inheritance? What, and, and we don't think concretely enough about life after, life after death. I'm, and I said that purposefully. We don't think deeply enough about it. We don't know. In fact, I was with some of my dear friends uh, on our board, and, and we were having this conversation a number of weeks back, and they were kind of unpacking their views of, well, or actually, we don't really know what is it like. Are we kind of disembodied spirits, or what does that look like? Or what, what does it look like? If you can't think specifically and concretely about what the afterlife, afterlife is going to entail in Christ, in His kingdom, in His forever kingdom, it's very difficult to live appropriately. And so we end up living these kind of halfway fruitful Christian lives that never really measure up to anything we see in the Bible. You don't want that. I promise you you don't want that. We think that somehow we can remove ourselves and just say, hey, I'm saved by grace through faith, and all that's true. But once you're saved, that's the beginning of your journey with Jesus, not the end. It's so critical that we see that. What is it about our inheritance? Well, let's go to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. We know, and we saw last week, that we've been redeemed in Christ through faith by His grace Nothing, we don't do anything to deserve this. And then we're adopted as children of God. And then he gives us an inheritance. And we're going to see this with even more stark relief today. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Listen to what Peter says. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Anointed One, the Messiah, who according to what? His great mercy, it's not based on, not predicated on anything that I ever do, has caused us. He, he's the causal agent in your salvation, by the way. Many of us think, you know, well, you know, I started exploring, I read this book, I was pursuing God. Well, that may be true from our vantage point, but I think once you've been walking with the Lord long enough, you look back over your life and go, it was all Him. The longer I walk with Jesus, the more I look back with humility, not uh, I went on this great spiritual journey, and it was just amazing. You should have seen all the books I read. I was really amazing. Uh, I, was, I was an interesting character in my life. I, you know, I'm a really a sleuth. I've always kind of been a sleuth, kind of always liked those kind of movies, and I was sleuthing, and I just really finally found God. That was kind of, in some ways, my perception of me in the, in, in the pursuit of what I perceived to be really one-sided, me pursuing God as if God was hiding. And the longer I've walked with him, I look back and I was going, I was dead. I was running the other way. He's the one that, in, he, he's the one that sent people into my life. He's the one that had you know, my mother praying for me. He's the one that I just, one thing after another, and I go, it was all him. And that's what this is saying. He caused us to be born again, but how? To a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus through, from being raised from the dead, right? The resurrection of Jesus, okay, uh, having been raised from the dead. Now, what's fascinating about this is that our hope lies in what? His resurrection, not just His atonement, meaning not that He just died and covered my sins. My real hope is that He was literally, physically, in a body, not, not our kind of body, and we're going to talk about that. 
in a body raised, and people could hug him and touch him, and he, and he ate fish by the Sea of Galilee. And like I've said before, it didn't fall out on the ground. He wasn't an apparition. Thomas said, I won't believe unless I feel the nail scars in his hands. And he leaves them. And Thomas didn't go, oh, where, where did it go? Jesus, where's your hand? He wasn't in a hologram or an apparition of any kind. And yet he could appear and disappear in a body. Now, that's not the kind of body I have. That is not the kind of body I have. If I did, I'd, be, I'd have my own stint in the sphere in Las Vegas right now. And I'd just be able to appear and disappear. I wouldn't need any stunts or special effects. The, the hope comes in the fact that Jesus was raised from the dead. Therefore, if we've been baptized in the likeness of his death, we'll be raised in the likeness of his resurrection, Paul had told the Romans. And that gets me hopeful, very hopeful. So that what? So that I might, and here it is, verse 4. Look, verse 4. So that I might obtain an inheritance which is imperishable, undefiled, will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. So let's unpack that a little bit. An inheritance? Okay, so because of my hope and belief in the resurrection of Jesus, okay, so we know. We can always say, well, what's the bottom line? Thief on the cross. I'm a sinner. Hey, we deserve what we're getting. He doesn't. Jesus, will you remember me when you come into your kingdom? So he believed he was a sinner, uh, the one thief uh, chastising the other thief on the other side of Jesus. He believed he was a sinner. He believed that Jesus was the king of the cosmos, and he believed that he was going to come into a kingdom, thereby obviously showing that he believed that Jesus was going to be raised from the dead, that he wasn't just going to be put out in the dirt, become dirt again, and never to be seen again. He believed that he would be a forever king. That's all the thief believed, and he, that was enough for Jesus to say, today you will be with me in paradise. Now, if that's true, the hope of the resurrection, and you believe that, then you have an inheritance. I, I, you need to get this. You don't earn this inheritance. You believe into this inheritance. And then you began to serve the king of the universe because an inheritance is in front of you. You're not a short-term thinker anymore. The problem with Israel's religious leaders is that they, not that they didn't care about the inheritance, is that they imagined that they could achieve the inheritance, and then they saw most of the inheritance. Certainly, even the Sadducees didn't even believe in the resurrection, but they believed they could achieve it, and they were so short-term in their thinking. The Zealots were, and the Sadducees for sure. The Pharisees did believe in a resurrection, but it's a little bit questionable as to what they actually saw that looking like. It certainly didn't include all of us nasty Gentiles not in their equation, although their prophets had talked about it for years, that they were actually called to be a light. Now, that would be Jesus, and it would believe, we'll see next week, it would be, be, be those Jewish men and women who believed in Jesus, and they would be a light to the nations. And we're reading one of them, Peter. So let's look at this, an inheritance. First of all, an inheritance is imperishable. This inheritance is imperishable. <clears throat> now, it may seem like right now, People like Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos and things like that, they have an inheritance that would be imperishable. I mean, you just couldn't ever run out of money. I mean, you get to a certain level. I mean, you're talking hundreds of billions of dollars. I mean, who can outspend that? I mean, you really would have a hard time outspending that. But over time, through successive generations, uh, somebody's going to come along, they're going to mismanage you, they'll have a bad investment. And somewhere down the line, even that kind of inheritance will be perishable. Certainly, if you're thinking beyond this life, it's only good while Jeff is breathing. At the moment he steps and breathes his last, all of that inheritance, all of that stuff, not just the material, but everything will immediately transfer into the accounts of other people that whoever he has already designated as his trustees, right? So, what? It's, in a sense, it's perishable. But even in a more broad sense, we don't have any appetite. We can't think of anything in our lives in the physical realm that is not undergoing the second law of thermodynamics, which is entropy. Everything in our mind, if you buy a new house, you're like, hey, it's brand new. It's just really fantastic. And then a year in, you're like, I can't believe we're having to repair this roof already. I can't believe 
this concrete is, is, you know, being upended here. I can't believe, you know. I mean, this church is going to be nice and new for a little bit. And then, you know, we'll have to maintain it and constantly because everything in our lives. I, I read something the other day. It's called glycation. I was telling Laura about it. And uh, it's uh, this chemical process that happens in our body from the moment you're born till the time that you die, you're basically cooking. No, it's true. It's called glycation. And so as we eat more sugar and more processed foods and all this kind of thing, it binds to these proteins in our bodies and it increases, it accelerates the cooking process and we die earlier. But if you look at the cartilage or whatever of an infant, it's all white and nice. And you look at the cartilage of an older person, my cartilage, and you look at that, it's starting to brown like it's been in an oven of sorts. It's called glycation. That's just entropy. Things move from a state of order to a state of disorder. It's impossible to circumvent that in a fallen world. The world that Jesus talks about, the future kingdom, no more tears, no more death, no more, right? That all somehow will be suspended. This law of entropy will be suspended. It's one of the hallmarks of our faith. Things won't perish. I can't get that into my head. I just, I can't. It just, I don't feel it. I can theorize. I can kind of speculate and try to, what would that feel like? Imagine an inheritance that is completely, well, it's not subject to any decay. It's not, so it's always going to be there. Think about that for a minute. And yet we're living for a momentary inheritance, for a momentary gratification when this, as, this is at the helm. This is possible that we will inherit something that will be imperishable. That's crazy to me. Secondly, undefiled. No one's going to suffer because of my actions. And I won't suffer from other people's actions. It's undefiled. It's holy. This inheritance, this state of existence, it's not just money. Like, all right, you were down there. You were a follower of Jesus. Here's your, you know, I guess, it's like the PJ Tour now. They're just getting all this money from this new organization, this uh, new uh, investment group. And Tiger gets $100 million. Rory's going to get $50 million. It's not like people come to the pay win. I think the whole thing was like a little over $900 million in these PJ Tour players that didn't go to live. If you don't know what I'm talking about, it's fine. But... There's enough golfers in here that you'll understand. And then they, they're, they're parsing this money out. They're dispersing this money based on the, how important the person was. And uh, sometimes we think about that. No, no, no. This is completely undefiled. This is, this is an inheritance that comes to you, and it will never lead to your own suffering. You know, we've seen this many times, the poor little rich kid dynamic. And I, you know, you hear about this, and I've spoken about this before, but I'm always fascinated in reading about this pledge gift and all this that the Warren Buffetts of the world and many of these multi-billionaires have already told their, uh, the ones that would inherit their, their stuff to say, oh, you're, you're, you're going to get a little piece of this, but you will not inherit the lifestyle and the kind of whole thing that you see here. And why do they do that? Because an inheritance can actually be defiling to the recipient. It can crush a person. It can crush a young person to get a hundred million dollars or even 10 million or whatever at a younger age and then they don't steward it properly and they go out and they kill themselves with it basically either their soul spiritually or their they literally i mean inheritance proverbs is clear an inheritance qu gained early in their life is lost quickly it's not a great thing but this inheritance is not like that this inheritance is undefiled it's holy. It, it's going to make the possessors of this inheritance. And again, we're not just talking about, there, I don't know, there's going to be currency in heaven, right? But it's the totality. And ultimately, it's Jesus at the center of it. Jesus is completely the unblemished lamb. He's undefiled. He's ultimately our inheritance. We get to be in his presence. We, can, we get to worship him and engage with him. And, and for all of eternity, he's our ultimate inheritance. So don't just think in a materialistic way when you think of inheritance but it's completely and utterly undefiled. I don't know if you've ever thought deeply about that, but that's very, very exciting. And I would tell you this, this inheritance, if it's undefiled and doesn't cause pain, it'll be like a snowball. 
So if everybody's inheritance is undefiled and thereby, thereby not able, not capable of causing pain, where you have the haves and the haves nots, and so my inheritance is now being used as Jesus would, and because I'm, I've become, the Bible says that we'll see him as he is and we'll become like him, then everything that accrues to me, including Jesus himself, I'm going to want to be giving away. And what that's gonna, what's that going to do? Just like you see kind of a snowball effect in evil, where an evil ideology will come and people will adopt it, and then you see this degradation because of a worldview, and then you end up in chaos and, and anarchy at the end. This will be the antithesis of that. This, this inheritance will be undefiled. And so when we receive this, Jesus being the epicenter of it, and we begin to live in this world, rather than being degraded and going from bad to worse, it's going to go from great to continuously greater. It's imperishable. Think about that. It's hard to even contemplate that. If you do get money, if you win the power, if you win the Powerball lottery or something, the first thing they do, you better not tell anybody why. Because everybody's going to be after your stuff. You better give your money to a money manager. Try not to try to be as quiet as you can if you don't have to be public about it. I read a deal where a guy he made three hundred fifty million dollars. This is probably ten years ago, and uh, he literally had zero after about ten years. Zero. He had a granddaughter that came in and took abused it and this and that. That's a defiled inheritance. That's something that starts here and begins to diminish and go wrong, and eventually it causes chaos. Inheritances can do this, not this kind of inheritance, not in this kind of an environment, which will be the kingdom environment that we'll all live in. Are you with me? I mean, let's think deeply about this. Let's not just say, you know, heaven out there, clouds and Harps and Charmin and little songs and unending worship songs and I'll always be looking at my watch. It'll be timeless. You won't have watches, by the way. So, you, no, we have to think, could this be true? What does this mean for me? And how would this affect the way I live now? How do I get this inheritance? I believe in the resurrection that he caused me to be born again and it gives me great hope, and then he gives me this inheritance. Wow, it's imperishable. It's holy. It'll, it'll go from great to greater. This, this totality of life after death will just go from great to great to greater to greater to greater. I, I, I can't, nothing in my life does that. Everything's always dissolving. I make a friend, they move away. I marry a spouse, they die of cancer. They get dementia, you know? I have children, you know, and I know some of you have suffered this in your own families, and they commit suicide. I, I, you know, I bought that great house, and a hurricane blew it over. You know, I mean, everything in our existence is like, we feel like we have such, it's so transitory. It's just like, ah, you know? And we do everything we can. We get insurance. We get money managers. We get all this, you know, preserve this for us. Make sure that, make sure it lasts. Think about all the energy we expend to do that. We don't have to do that in the eternal realm. Our inheritance is un... It's not perishable. It's not subject to entropy. It's undefiled. It moves from good to better for all of eternity. What would that culture even look like? Think about this for a minute. I squeaked there. Think about this for a minute. <laughs> Like Toy Story, that little, that little guy that got that thing kind of started. Sorry about that. Anyway, okay, let's start over. Think about this. Think about this for a minute, right? Think about this for a second. I mean, just try to, you can't imagine because it's contrary to everything we just internalize and have for our whole lives. I've said this before, and I'll repeat myself, and everybody goes, yeah, we know. Um, I, I can't imagine all the advances we've had with the, trying to have sin and, and, and chaos in the world and pain and suffering and bad actors and everything, and we've still advanced in ways that, you know, 100 years ago, they couldn't have fathomed the world we live in and self-driving cars and iPhones and health advances that we've had. It's just unimaginable. 
And that, imagine that without anything being perishable, without anything being defiled. We do that with defiled hearts. Secular ways of thinking can still advance culture, which is why we were put in the garden in the first place, which means that's the very purpose for which we were created, to cultivate and to keep. That's etymologically where we get our, taught on this before. It's where we get culture from cultivate. God put us in the earth, gave us, made us image bearers, not creators. We can create, but we're not the ultimate creator. We're creators that have been ourselves created, and he put us in the garden to create this beautiful culture. That's really what the purpose of your creation was. And then the fall happened, and you say, yeah, it's a horror show on earth, but there's been some amazing advances. If we can advance this far, just because we have unity of heart, a company like Apple or something has the unity of vision or whatever, some clarity, and they can produce an iPhone that's just mind-boggling. Imagine what that's going to look like 10,000 years from now where everybody's on the same page, where everybody's living in a non-diminishing, ever-increasing, undefiled world that will never fade away. What will that even look like? If we can put a rover onto Mars, what do you think that's going to look like? I, I think we'll be, I personally, this is total speculation on my part, we'll have a new heavens and a new earth. But notice the new heavens mean the total of the galaxy, our universe, and other, uni other universes I don't know, but I wouldn't have any problem with God saying, you know, to go explore my other galaxies. Once you get a little, yeah, let's go, I, I don't know. But all that seems incredibly possible under the parameters of our existence, our inheritance being imperishable and undefiled and never fading away, which is the third part of that. And it will not fade away. Can you grasp that? Yes and no. But I get very excited when I think about it. How can you just play our holy little huddle game and we go to church and we go back and live just normal lives that nobody can tell the difference. We are bearers, ambassadors of this very message right here in the Coachella Valley. I don't think if I've got people in the church that don't even think concretely about it, what do people out there think? What do they perceive about their own purpose for existence? They don't know. So they live in a reactionary way. And we're seeing a lot of that reactionary behavior in our culture today. I feel this. I, this is my truth. This is my, look, I, I understand the sentiment, but there is a way, and his name is Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. It's a powerful thought. And then finally, it's reserved in heaven for you. It's imperishable. It's undefiled. It's not going to fade away. And, you know, it's reserved. Now, because of where we live and all that, we're used, a lot of you are used to having reserved places, reserved parking places, reserved tables when you go to a restaurant, you know, VIP access. It's just kind of where we live. You know, if I was somewhere called to be involved in the advancement of the kingdom in a, in a place, and then that would be maybe hard to perceive, but a lot of us, and so this may not seem very significant. This is incredibly significant. Imagine this, it's reserved in heaven for those who have a hope in the resurrection. Maybe you're not of the, you know, you're not used to VIP treatment. You're not used to having something reserved in your name when you go to dinner, you know, except for what I have reserve, reserve and the guy calls out, number 43, your order's up, number 43. So that's, a, that's my reservation that I've had through the years, but, but maybe that's been you, right? But this, the, everything we're talking about now, you get a new name, and it's already there, you know? There's Mark, you know, it's just, here's your reservation, you know? This is your inheritance, imperishable, undefiled, never fade away. We have to think about these things. Jesus wanted us to think about these things. Think concretely, not abstractly. Think concretely about these things. You know, when I think about, by the way, not fading away, I don't know about you, but when I was a kid, we had, my dad would uh, maybe have one or two weeks of vacation during the whole year, okay? And uh, we, it was, 
I, that's why I love to fly fish and stuff because we would go from Texas and it would take us a day and a half of driving to go up through the corner of New Mexico and get up into southern Colorado and get in this play, little place called Lake City. We went every summer. It was awesome. And, uh, you know, we go through Santa Fe and, you know, you get a look at all the turquoise jewelry and stuff that they have in Santa Fe, whatever. And uh, you'd make your way up and you'd get closer and closer. And, I, and, you know, living, especially when we lived in West Texas uh, when I was in high school and stuff, junior high. You know, it's just flat and dirt storms in places like Lubbock and Amarillo and stuff like that. And, and you just, you don't see any mountains, you don't see anything. And when you just start to kind of smell the pines, ha, 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 and you stick your head out the door. And of course, we didn't have, you know, iPads or any of that, but we did have transistor radios in my day. And you'd be trying to, eh, and you could barely hear it. And you'd be holding it to your head and you'd sit in the back. And, uh, and we were trying to make our way. And again, you know, if we had a week, we'd be traveling a day and a half there and a day and a half back. Then you only have like four or five days there, max. And uh, I mean, the second we pulled in, you'd go as fast as you can to get your fishing license. You know, now you can do it over online. You know, you get, get your fishing lines. What, you know, what kind of flies are they? You know, and we'd hit the river until dark. And it was just from morning till dark all day long. We'd just fly fish and, you know, just go and go and go. But the second we arrived, I have to be honest with you, I was already dreading tomorrow we leave. Have you ever had that? It's like vacations almost became punishment because the moment I was arriving, I was just that much closer to leaving. It was like the best part of the vacation was thinking about it on the months to get, leading up to leaving to getting there, right? And so it's kind of like, oh, man, in another three weeks, it's gonna, we're going to leave this dusty, you know, hot Texas kind of thing. We're going to go up in elevation, and I just can't wait. And we're almost, we're going to get there one day, you know. And then, and, then, and then all of a sudden, I smell it, and I can see the foothills, and, and then a little bit larger. And then you see the Rockies looming, and a little snow cap still on the top of the mountains, you know and uh, the runoff and the river, and you could get out and you could smell and, and hear the river, and it was just plagued with this internal dialogue that you're just, you're just four days away from having to leave all this. <laughs> it's a terrible thing, you know, it's such a weird thing. But that is the human experience, whether it's your vacation or whether it's time with your children and, and mothers thinking there's, there's going to come a day when we're going to have to drop them off at college. And, and I remember that day with Savannah, our first, and, and she was only an hour and a half away. I mean, some send their kids to, you know, Timbuktu or wherever, and we were just an hour and a half away. And, and we got back and we, everybody was just, oh, you know, it was terrible. And we got back in the car, and Tess was, you know, she was the smallest, and she was just sobbing, and she was just like, I hate, the, I hate college. I hate all of this. This is the worst thing of my life, you know. So having kids or anything, you know that at some point it's just going to fade away. And your, te- your joy is tempered by the reality that nothing lasts. Not with this inheritance. Are you with me? Don't just read over that like a Hallmark card. Dwell in it. Imperishable? Really? Undefiled? It's not going to cause me pain or cause others pain? It'll never quit? It's not going to have an end? Do you realize, and again, I talk about this a lot because I think about it a lot. When I have relationships here, kingdom relationships, especially, as we'll see in the next couple of weeks, in the context of missional community, there's not quite anything like doing, being on mission with other men and women that are of like mind to advance the kingdom now. I don't know what it is. It's just a, and unless you've experienced it, and we all have different giftings, but when we come together and we're in unity about let's go have an impact in the valley or let's have an impact, like with Lynx, let's have an impact in 
to kings and queens at these, in these golf places, or, or it's Coachella Valley Rescue Man. Let's, let's go feed the poor and tell them that God loves them and care for them and take them through the new life programs or, or orphans or, or, or whatever with Olive Crest or all these glorious things. And we get really riveted what I always think about. And I think about this a lot. And I really do. It's, a, it's, it's something that I force myself to think about. These kingdom relationships will never end. It's part of the not fade away stuff. So in a strange turn of events, rather than always having relationships that we know one day will end and being tempered by that in the, in the scene realm, what I do is I think out and I think, yes, they may stop breathing or I may stop breathing first, but we'll be reunified in the future and we will spend all of eternity together. And it won't be corrupted because it's undefiled. So now are you ready for this? In many ways, not only is Jesus my inheritance and uh, Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you. So the environment will be prepared by Jesus. It'll be suitable and for the habitat of our new bodies that are really cool, right? That don't have entropy and all these other kinds of things. And then all of a sudden I realize, guess who also is my inheritance? You. Now, when you start thinking of somebody being your in, another person, being your eternal inheritance, what you do is you quit doing the quid pro quo thing. Whatever they can offer me, however they can benefit me. I got a network, you know, I hate all that stuff. You know, you got, let's get involved in this group and we do all this networking. And if we can network and meet all these people, they can really make our dreams come true because they've got something I need and maybe I have something they need. No, not in the future realm, right? In this future reality, it's going to be, this is eternal, unfading, right? Never to be lost again, relationships. You are my inheritance. I may be part of your inheritance. And then in a cross-sectional way, and that's what Jesus meant. He says, look, if you're going to do this, make friends for yourself with your money, your mammon of unrighteousness, that's, that one day you'll be invited into eternal dwellings. What did he mean by that? He meant there's an eternality to the relationships that you have now. Some of you out there feel very lonely, very disconnected. Maybe you're watching on television or otherwise, and, and you just feel so disconnected, and you're just like, man, I don't think even anybody knows my name. I'd love to be walk into cheers and have somebody say norm you know or something like it where everybody knows your name look part of the beauty is not that you become a slave sent as we'll see next week into the vineyard it's not that okay god's going to abuse you by just sending you back into a world that doesn't like you and persecute you which is true what he's actually setting up for you is an eternal reality of an inheritance co-mingled with others who are on the exact same page. And the more you get excited about your interconnectivity, you say, we cannot keep this to ourselves. We've got to go out and share. We want other people to be invited to the party, the eternal party, and even to the party now. And that's, that to me is healthy growth in church, right? Missionally driven stuff, not just creating a better mousetrap. We don't have the greatest of all things, right? We're going to move into a building that's only 8,000 square feet. People, I hope you do realize this is not even the main sanctuary. Some of you go, oh, I liked it better when we were at UCR. You know, you know, maybe. I don't know what it's going to feel. I mean, it's going to feel great because it's ours and we can't get kicked out and stuff, uh, to my knowledge. Um, but you, you, you do realize it's about relationship. It's about our mission together and inviting other people to come in and be on mission with us. That seems very, well, I'm going to, I'll use some very technical language here. That seems very cool to me. You know what I mean? I mean, who wouldn't want that? That's what this means. So think deeply about that. I think some of them wanted an inheritance. They wanted the inheritance, so they killed the son. There are people, everybody wants something good. All the protesting that you see across the country, college campuses and the, they want something good. Now, you may, th I, I happen to be on the other side of, of, of these protesters right now. 
but I can't, I can't impugn the fact that they want something that in their eyes is beneficial to the world and themselves. I think they're on the wrong side of the cause, you know? I may even feel that about what kind of is going on out, out here, you know? But so people want the inheritance, whatever that means and however they would describe that, whether they see that as short-term or long-term. But you can't kill the message of Jesus in the process. The only inheritance, and I'll, this is the close. <laughs> the only inheritance is through the belief in the resurrection, the hope, and Jesus the Messiah, the King of the cosmos, Jesus Himself. That's it. And that inheritance is what we discussed this morning, undefiled, not subject to entropy, never fade away, right? Reserved in heaven in another realm for you. That's worth coming to church for, right? That's worth giving your life. Thank you very much for that. That was powerful feedback there. Uh, that's true, isn't it? And then that exciting? We can take that. And that's worth advancing and giving our whole lives for. That's worth laying down our lives, which is what these vineyard growers were unwilling to do. They thought if we lay down the life of the son, then we can get the inheritance. And as we'll see next week, when we lay down our lives, we actually advance the cause for more people to have reservations in the eternal realm, which will, by the way, be a new earth. We're not going off to some, you know, spaceship into the, you know, ether land and be disembodied spirits. We're going to have new bodies in a new heavens and a new earth, and we'll be advancing culture for all of a time with nothing to hold us back. That's heaven. That's heaven. And I will always tell this story until they throw dirt on me.